now we turn our eyes to ordinary amplitude modulation and we say that an ordinary amplitude modulated signal is generated by adding a large carrier signal to the double side band signal and therefore the ordinary am signal will take the form of region 3 5 we are simply saying that we are adding another carrier that has amplitude a and then when we add that so we have the original carrier that is modulated and another one that is not modulated so when you add these two you add up with a different amplitude which is a plus mt because we said in the dsb the constant of proportionality was considered to be equals to one therefore the spectrum of ax or the modulated signal will simply be the Fourier transform of this when you Fourier transform this so again uh, just taking the Fourier transform of this uh, will give us uh, it may not be very straightforward but here we are introducing the concept of, uh, of scaling sorry this is not even uh, uh, scaling we are just breaking doing Fourier transform of this alone and do the Fourier transform of this alone and when you do the Fourier transform of the a cos omega ct you will actually find that uh, this is purely going to, to remain as a coefficient and since we know the Fourier transform of, of cos of anything is going to be equals to pi del of omega minus omega c plus del of omega plus omega c this is a parameter therefore when you have uh, a then you just introduce your a there therefore we are able to get that term and similarly the Fourier transform of the other one uh, Fourier transform of uh, m of t cos omega c t we said that uh, this follows the idea of you, you first for break this uh, into euler's formula and what we figured out is that uh, we end up with uh, two terms of this that are frequency shifted one to the positive and the other one to the negative so it simply becomes one over two the Fourier transform of on of message uh, shifted by in frequency by that and of course plus uh, m uh, shifted uh, to the left which is omega c like that therefore when we have that that is purely what comes in as uh, the spectrum of the amplitude modulated signal so if you are then to uh, to, to draw these two signal or this signal in the frequency domain the first thing you definitely know is that the Fourier transform of message signal is simply this the varies uh, it is a bisbad signal that is uh, drawn as that the highest frequency component is at omega m and uh, so x a m is represented as this so as this as this diagram here so the only observation that we make here is that we we said that the amplitude of our of our modulated signal has been shifted or has been lifted increased by a and therefore you observe that uh, a we lift uh, our zero our zero was supposed to be here and therefore it will be lifted by a value equals to a and this is actually uh the value of a and therefore before we even go to the, the issues of amplitude we see that we in the frequency domain we have introduced the dial omega minus uh, uh omega c and this is placed at the same place as the message the message uh component which was placed at the same point and therefore what you observe is that we have the the spectrum of the message plus the 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 impasse 
uh, response, which is uh, drawn by a narrow located at the center frequency, which is omega c. And for that reason, this is a new spectrum that we observe, which is now significant. Now we do not have the suppressed carrier. Remember, because the, the other time we had carrier suppressed, now we have carrier, no suppressed carrier. Huh? Or no suppressed, like we had in the DSB. And therefore, this becomes uh, uh, the AM, the, or the spectrum of an AM modulated uh, signal. Now we can jump to how do we detect uh, such a an AM modulated signal and we make a few observations that uh, contrary to what we observed in the DSB, uh, if there is sufficient uh, lifting or boosting of the, uh, the, the amplitude of the carrier signal uh, XA of M, which was given, which is given by this, then we can simply observe something like this. If our message was following uh, something like this, and our carrier was taking this shape, then we can simply observe the envelope. This is what called the envelope, the amplitude of the modulated signal. And you can simply observe the amplitude of your received signal without caring about the two items that were very problematic with DSB. That is the face of the uh, received signal or the, the local carrier uh, signal and its frequency. We say that for DSB, they must be synchronized, but if we can be able to observe the, the envelope, then that requirement is there no more. So for that reason, we come up with a condition for proper demodulation of AM, and we simply say that uh, if A plus MT is always bigger than zero for all T, then our shape or the, the amplitude of our modulated signal will always be above zero, and therefore we can simply sketch, uh, remove our the carrier, and our envelope becomes our message signal, just as it was sent uh, before uh, modulation, but we are we are observing that from equation uh, from this figure. Okay, this figure meets the condition. But if A is uh, sometimes less than MT, then you can observe MT going below the uh, x-axis or the t-axis, and for that reason, when you try to perform the uh, to receive the modulated signal, you are going to see that here the, the, the signal is below, but here is going up. Therefore, this is going to be a introduced distortion in terms of uh, received modulated signal. And for that reason, this is not going to work. Therefore, this condition must has not been met. And therefore, we, are, we have improperly received uh, a mod or modulated signal. Well, the condition is expressed in two forms that you can first of all you can say that the total amplitude of the modulated signal uh, plus the one that has been added a must always be bigger than zero for all t or you can say that if you bring mt towards the right then you can say simply say that a must always uh, be bigger than the minimum value of the mt as illustrated in equation 3 8. So there is another concept that we introduced that is called modulation idex, and uh, it's just a very, very good figure that tells us when we have uh, modulation or we have distortion if, if we have not done our modulation properly. And we are defining the modulation idex for AM signal as the minimum value of uh, the message signal, which is M of T. So if you if you say that the absolute value, meaning that the, the smallest value irrespective of the whether it is positive or negative, this becomes our modulation idex. And we are saying that from the condition that we have said that A must always be bigger than or equals to the minimum value, which was, we, we, we have said earlier. Uh, there's something that we observe here, M of T must be bigger than that. 
Therefore, since we are saying that uh, this is the ratio that, that we require, if you divide, divide by A and you divide by A and you say that this is equal to mu, then there's something that we are saying that uh, we are always going to see that this will always be uh, less than one because this is always smaller. This is always smaller than this. Therefore, when it is always smaller, then you can always guess that that modulation idx will always be less than one or less than or equal to, to one. Therefore, we are saying that when we find that uh, mu is bigger than one, we see that we have a carrier has been overmodulated and therefore this results in enveloped Finally, to we can show that uh, we can what we have just expressed that you can we use we can use the envelope detector to without needing the phase and the frequency at the receiver to be synchronized at the the transmitter. We can show how we can be able to follow the envelope of the receive signal. Uh, using the envelope detector and you see now that figure 3 5a shows the simplest form of an envelope detector that is consisting of a diode a resistor and capacitor combination and the operation of the detector would be as follows that during the positive half cycle of the input signal we must remember that our signal is still uh, following the carrier frequency, therefore you are still going to find uh, the signal with the frequency omega c. So it is going to be making the positive and the negative cycles. So we are saying that when it is following the positive cycle, that is the positive cycle of our received input signal, the diode is going to be forward biased and therefore it is going to transmit or to allow the signal to pass through. The capacitor C, when the, uh, the charge, not the charge, but when the current flows through, is going to cause this capacitor to charge very rapidly to attain a peak value. So it obtains a peak value of the input signal. Then as the input signal falls below its maximum, so now it is started, uh, it starts falling at this point and it reaches, goes below the capacity, uh, the charge or the voltage of the capacitor. Then of course it is, the current is flowing through, through both the resistor and uh, the capacitor. Then uh, it is going to turn off because the diode, uh, when the voltage on this side is higher than uh, this one, then this is going to be reverse biased, and therefore it is not going, it is going, when it is reverse biased, it does not transmit the current. Therefore, it is going to turn off. This is followed by a slow discharge. So when it turns off, the capacitor starts discharging. That is when you are, what you are seeing, a, a, a slight discharge happening there. So it, it was peak, the, the capacitor was uh, charged rapidly and it attains the, the, the peak value of the CB signal. And then when it starts dropping, this starts uh, discharging slowly, slower than the, the, the frequency of uh, the carrier. So we're saying that, uh, this is follows, followed by a slow discharge of the capacitor and through the resistor until the next positive cycle. So this becomes our next positive uh, cycle, half cycle. And when the input signal becomes greater again, so this will have discharged slightly, but it will not have reached zero. Remember that this signal has gone up to zero and coming back again. So, but uh, our capacitor will only have this, uh, discharged slightly less uh, than the, the one you'd expect uh, at this point. So, what we observe is that uh, when the charge of the input signal or the received signal now or the voltage 
of the receive signal becomes bigger than that of the capacitor, the capacitor starts charging again. And because the, the diode has turned on, and therefore the capacitor starts charging again, and uh, it attains a new peak value, equivalent to that of the input value at the instant on which uh, the peak value, the capacitor has uh, charged. And the process is gets repeated. So here we are charging a capacitor attains the peak value, then this is increasing very rapidly, but this is decreasing just slowly. And the rate of uh, discharge of a capacitor, if you remember uh, from uh, circuit theory, is always given by the peak value, which my, we can denote as E0, and then it's going to discharge exponentially with the rate of time of RC. And RC is the capacitor, uh, the capacitor resistor uh, combination, and this one of RC is always called the discharge time. Or the discharge constant. So, or rather, the discharge constant is just uh, one uh, RC, and therefore it is going to discharge with, with respect to one over uh, T over RC. So, how is it that we are seeing that this problem is uh, explained uh, in detail in uh, uh, problem 3.6, and we are simply saying that for the proper operation of the envelope detector, the discharge time. You know, the, the major characteristic that we have observed is the discharge time. How much is the capacitor discharging with respect to the, uh, the input uh, signal that is charging, uh, that, that is varying way much faster in the rate of omega, omega C. So we are saying that the main characteristic that, that, we, that we work with that determines how well the cap uh, the capacitor discharges or the envelope detector follows the the, the the envelope of the received signal is determined mainly by uh, by the discharge time constant of of the of the capacitor and therefore you are seeing that this constant must be chosen appropriately to make sure that uh, our our envelope is followed accordingly. And we can actually so show that very uh, very quickly and say that uh, consider you have the received input signal, the one that you're calling uh, X AM of T, the one that you're receiving here, is characterized by what we said earlier, that we have uh, an amplitude that we have um, we are added, and we say that this is equivalent, uh, then you add to MT, and MT might also be varying with time, and therefore we are giving it the frequency of your message signal to be cos uh, omega m, and therefore the the function of your message signal is going to be m of t cos omega m t. This is multiplied by the carrier frequency cos omega c t, and therefore, or rather, like there, and therefore the, you add up with this equation. You can simply say, remember that we have said that. Uh, uh, mu is equals to this uh, mt divided by a, and therefore if you replace uh, this with mu, you can simply say that uh, a mt is equals to a mu. That is why we have mu here times a. You end up with that. So having said that, we are saying that we have already said that the mu must always be between zero and one. And also the other condition is that omega C or the carrier frequency must be much greater than the highest frequency component of our message. Therefore, it, can, it is required that we actually observe this uh, requirement that you have said that you must choose appropriately. You are going to find that, that you can prove this. I, for the sake of time, I will avoid the, the proving, but you are going to realize that the quotation for the detector or the envelope detector to follow accurately the envelope of our received signal it should it should actually show that uh, the discharge time constant should be less than or equals to one over the highest frequency component of our message multiplied by root of one minus mu squared mu mu is what we call the modulation index all over mu 
And therefore that, if we meet this condition, then you're going to see that the detector will follow the envelope at all times. And therefore you'll actually see that uh, instead of having even this big dip, it's actually going to put following a very smooth, uh, very smooth curve, just like we require to, uh, to achieve. 